I don't know about you, but today I felt my heart beating quite fast as I listened to everything the other two presenters said because I thought, oh my goodness, there's so much that can go wrong with babies. Oh, how can we ever get it right? So I want to kind of bring it back to the fact that actually there is physiological, there is normal, and there is hope because actually most of us survive and most of our babies survive. We just need to be really alert to the fact that sometimes there's deviation from the normal and we need to be there to pick that up. We need to be available. We need to be assessing. We need to be referring on from there, not just thinking, I'm an island, I can do it all myself. I am the uh, oracle of all knowledge because we aren't. We need each other, we need community actually. And all of us in our different roles in different places are part of that community that help keep mums and babies really well. So I wanna start off with um, just looking at a case scenario which has been part of an HDC inquiry in the past quite a number of years back. And then also look a bit at the physiology and behaviours that affect weight gain and weight loss in the first six weeks postpartum. Um, discuss how we can assess that uh, breastfeeding diet and then also look at hyponatremic dehydration, which again, Lindsay did do this morning, but I want to just revise that for us because sometimes it's something we don't see that often that we need to review to embed it for ourselves and then some appropriate actions to take in moving this forward. So just checking this case scenario quickly. So this was a 40 year old who was having her first baby and she had five scans which showed that the growth of that ba baby was normal. Everything else in terms of her vital signs were normal. However, she was a heavy smoker and used Arapax through her whole pregnancy. So what do we know about Arapax? What is it? What effect does it have on the newborn baby? Anybody want to just quickly throw out some things you know about Arapax? Is it an antidepressant? Yep, it's a serotonin. Serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Yep. Okay to use in breastfeeding. There's a lot of research that's come out to say it is okay to use while a woman's breastfeeding. And for those of you who are aware of Tom Hale's book, Medications and Mother's Milk, that's one of the best textbooks you can get around all this medication stuff during pregnancy and breastfeeding. One of the problems with Arapax, however, if a woman's using it through a whole uh, pregnancy period, is the withdrawal after the baby's born. So we need to just be aware of that with newborns where mum has been on Arapax, that we're looking for that baby who is not feeding well again. You know, again, what Lindsay was saying, that poor feeding is something you really wanna watch for. Um, the whole thing of a really irritable, crying baby, could it be because of some withdrawal? And then also, Later on, you get a hypoglycemic baby who may have seizures, although the seizures are very rare. But in this case, with this scenario, this baby did have seizures. So we just need to be aware of, again, that history taking, which Philip uh, again reminded us of, take a thorough history because we need to revise that history every time we come across a problem because that could be a clue to us. This is something I need to look at a little bit more closely. So this woman got to 40 weeks of pregnancy and she had a long latent phase of labor and she was very anxious. She reported severe contractions and she kept coming in and out of hospital. So they gave her some pethidine and later some Panadol, you know, try and keep her calm, keep her going to get through that long latent phase of labor. And finally, after numerous ins and outs of the hospital, she was, uh, there was an obstetric consultation and they did a CTG, which was considered to be reassuring at that time. And she had an ultrasound done where there was sufficient Lycor. And of course, later that night, the contractions became far more severe and they noticed uh, decelerations on the CTG G trace and so the obstetrician recommended a, um, a caesarean section. 
That baby was born at 1.45 and they had oral and nasal suction performed. No particular indication of why that happened. Um, and of course, as we've heard from Lindsay as well, around resuscitation now, we know things are different. That if it's a, even if it's a non-responsive baby, you don't need to suction in the presence of meconium lyco anymore. But at that stage, that was practice. Um, APCARs were seven and 10, so not terribly low, and the vital signs were within normal range. What do you think of the weight of this so baby? When you're saying term, it was 40, 40 weeks. weeks. 40 weeks. What do you think about that weight? Well, that's pretty small. She's a smoker, though. Yeah, she's a smoker. Yeah, she's a smoker. Yeah. 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 smoker. Yeah. yeah, so we don't know how big she was. We don't know how big her partner was either, but it does sound small, but she was a smoker. And I suppose I asked with five normal growth scans, or five scans where the growth was normal, mm, I'd, I'd be going, okay, is that normal I'd, at 40 weeks? But you know, there are a few unknowns there. So it's just what something to keep in mind. I don't know. <laughs> Obviously there was some concern or maybe mum was anxious about some things, but she had the five scans. And so when they did the exam of the baby, it was generally a very healthy newborn baby. And um, however, it wasn't put skin to skin, um, but breastfed then at 5.30 a.m. So it was born at about 1.30, 1.45, and breastfed for the first time at 5.30. So that's quite a long period of time between birth and the first feed. Had a few sucks, and so they gave one mil of colostrum by syringe, vital signs again normal, and then 11.30 a.m. it breastfed well after a bath. Again, you've got to ask, why a bath so early? You know, hypoglycemia, cold hypothermia occurring. And then the next recorded feed was 10.42 p.m. Now, we don't know what happened in between because <coughs> nothing was recorded. And remember, in any HTC case, if it's not written down, people go, it wasn't done. So you've got to be really meticulous about documentation. And this baby uh, fed for 20 minutes on one breast only. Again, we hear of a lot of babies breastfeeding for long periods of time, but if you don't watch them and it's a first time mother, how well are they feeding? How effectively are they feeding? Because babies can stay at the breast and do this suck, 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 or just little jitter sucks at the breast with not effective feeding. Temperature was still normal. Day one, it fed then at 3.45 a.m. So again, a long period of time from 10.42 to 3.45 and was said to have fed well from both breasts, suckling and swallowing noted, and then fed regularly thereafter, 7, 9, 10.45, whoops, yep, and 12. And again, good suckling and swallowing was obviously heard, noted at that time, and then fed again in the afternoon twice and then became unsettled. So remember, this is day one after the birth. And then that afternoon, poor feeding was noted. So they gave the baby some um, express breast milk by syringe at 8.30, after which it had a large bowel motion, and then it fed again. And 11.30, they tried to feed it. And 2.45, an unsuccessful breastfeed attempt was made and so they then woke the baby up and gave it five mils of express milk at 4.45. So they're quite big gaps between the feeding of this baby. And then at 8 a.m. it w w woke for a feed but went back to sleep and would not rouse to feed. 8.30, it was given four mils of EBM by syringe but it was sleepy and clammy. So the question is, what would you do at this stage? blood sugars okay and they were recorded as low in a temperature of 36.1 so of concern with this baby so then the baby as a result of that was given 13 mils of expressed breast milk by a nasogastric tube and a physician consult was undertaken and the blood sugar level after that EBM was 1.4, and what's the normal range? 
2.6. So when I first was trying to find out, you know how Lindsay said there is no good evidence of how we came across the 2.6, boy, could I not find that evidence either. So what I found looking at all the literature was somewhere a range around about 2.5 to 3. A, a recent study published by Masali from the um, Waikato Hospital in uh, the clinics of uh, neonatology talked about m less than 2.6 millimoles per litre as being the cutoff point. And so that's kind of the common range we seem to be using across hospitals, although when I presented this a couple of years back, there were a lot of variations in all the hospitals, but I think we're getting to some agreement. So after that, the um, baby was given 17 mils of EBM via nasogastric tube and seemed to get better, and then suddenly had a seizure at 10.05 a.m. that next day. And when they looked, blood sugars were lower, um, so they gave formula 20 mils. Temperature was still within normal range. And at 10.40, the temperature went up. Heart rate increased a little bit, but as Lindsay said, that could still be normal for some babies. Respirations 39, and baby had a dusky episode. So they commenced IV fluids, antibiotics, oxygen, and um, as a result of all those things, the unstable blood sugars, the seizures, apneic episodes, they decided to transfer this baby to a hospital with a neonatal unit. So it was actually in, a, in an area which was quite uh, remote from a hospital with a neonatal unit. Did the baby get any actual mucosa and deep gel? No, not at that stage, no. Not that we were aware of, other than when they started those IV fluids at 10.45 a.m. That would have been the first time. And this was well before the dextrose gel came in, this case. And, of course, the sad thing is this baby has had significant neurological problems, um, which, of course, affect that baby's life and its family's life for the rest of its life. So, you know, quite a tragic situation where... You've got to ask about all the things that we saw there in terms of the Arab packs, in terms of the frequency of feeding. Was there something else? Was there something that was missed? Did that baby not feed frequently you enough? You have to be really careful when we say we're hearing the baby suck and swallow. Yeah. If you're sucking something, you're producing saliva, mm -hmm. you're going to swallow. And so many people go, oh, well, there's, there's a swallow. It's the first swallow. The baby's been sucking for sufficient time to get a bit of saliva there to swallow. So, but, you know, I think we use that as, oh, it's swallowing, it's feeding, just yeah. part of what they're... Oh, look, I want to absolutely agree with that because I've listened to babies and I've heard this, mm, mm, and I'm thinking, gosh, that's amazing, swallowing. But actually, the baby's got nothing in at that stage because the mother's had no milk, and I've just figured boy, that kid is able to produce a significant amount of saliva that it's just swallowing. So we do need to watch that really carefully. But to be fair, though, if you'd heard swallowing with that baby and then expressed the mother and got 13 mils yeah, or whatever EBM, exactly you exactly would yeah. feel yeah. reassured. Yeah. yeah, you would think that baby would be getting something, but I think it's just keeping it all in balance to be aware of that's possible. That it can sound like baby's drinking, but it may actually I mean, not be swallowing. I mean, that was what I got it. A lot of time, you know, the mother's got that pain. Mm. Mm. When you put that on the Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could I just... Oh, sorry. Could I just ask when this was? Because I mean, nowadays, if the baby had not fed for those lengths of time, there would have been blood sugar was done well before. Yeah, I think that was about, whew, Mary, in 2005, five, six. It's quite a long time ago, more than 10 years ago. And I think midwives, we, we all practice getting a boost in cold, and uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what weight the baby is. Yes. Yeah. It's boost in cold, is abnormal, then it's an IUGR. Yep, yeah. absolutely. So I kind of think, looking at this whole picture of this uh, scenario I've just shown you, this was not a normal, healthy baby, okay? The mum, um, was a smoker, she was using Arapax. This baby didn't feed for quite extended periods of time, had low blood sugars, and, and I think was probably a growth-restricted baby, even though we don't have centiles. 
So we have to put it in, this baby needs a different kind of care from a baby who is normal, healthy, full-term breastfed baby. And what I'm focusing on with this presentation is to come back to what's normal for a healthy, full-term baby. So when I'm talking about aspects from now, I'm talking about the normal, healthy, full-term baby, not babies where mums have had um, growth restriction of smokers using particular drugs during pregnancy. So if you just could keep that in mind as we move forward from here. So what's normal behavior for a newborn baby? Obviously, one of the things we need to be aware of is when that baby's in utero, it's getting a continuous flow of food and oxygen through the umbilical cord and the umbilical vessels. The moment that baby is born and that cord is clamped and cut after delayed cord clamping, yes, I'm so glad that's part of normal resuscitation practice now that Lindsay mentioned, um, that baby is now reverting to intermittent feeding where it's got to say, excuse me, I'm hungry. Excuse me, could you feed me? And we need to be aware of the fact that sometimes mothers aren't aware of that. So part of keeping that mum and baby together, skin to skin in those early hours, is to enable them to see that that normal healthy baby is able to feed when it's ready, if the breast is available to it, and if the mother is willing to respond to that baby. So one of the studies that was done, which was a really quite simple study, was done by Steph Benson in Australia quite a long while ago, but she just got all these mothers who had normal, healthy, full-term babies to keep a diary, to find out what these babies did in the first few days after the birth. And basically what she found was that they, these babies had two patterns. They either fed very frequently in the first 24 hours and then just said, right, I'm stuffed. I'm either stuffed because I'm tired or I'm stuffed because I'm really full. And they went to sleep for about six or eight hours and then they woke up and fed again. And then there were others who said, gosh, you know, I fed really well straight after birth. I'm exhausted now, sleep for six to eight hours and then I'm going to feed frequently and it's usually by night two they're waking up to feed frequently and the mother's going oh my gosh I'm so tired I just need to sleep and baby's wanting to feed. The problem is it's unpredictable. None of us could say to a mum your baby is going to feed frequently for the first 24 hours so just be prepared for that and yours is going to actually just have one feed and then sleep for six to eight hours. Um, most of these babies, in fact all of them, didn't need formula top-ups. They were fine. They were healthy. Now, what do you think about this whole thing of sleeping for a six to eight hour period? Good? Not good? Depends on the Depends. Depends. Well, and they've got a really good feed after the they need to recover. Yeah. So it depends. It does depend on the woman. It depends on the baby. It depends on the birth, all of those kind of things. But generally, if it's an unmedicated birth, labor and birth, well, healthy mum, healthy baby, that six to eight hours would be okay. But again, you know, that mother may need help. There's an assumption that every mother's going to know that that's okay. We need to actually be with her, telling her, informing her, helping her. Yes, ma'am. I know she had pethidine. Did she have a spinal or epidural seizure mm. or GA? Um, we didn't know that, but I think she would have had a spinal at that stage. Yes. Yeah. But that case is different from just this general study of Steph Benson now, where we've got normal healthy women who are having this pattern of feeding after the baby. And we've already talked about this issue. How do we know it's a normal, healthy, full-term baby? So just always keep that in balance, okay? When you think about this pattern or these two patterns, always say to yourself, is this a normal, healthy baby? Catherine? Um, I was just thinking, particularly, this is 2001, and in 2001, we weren't having one in three or four women having cesarean. That's right. You know, and now we've got women who are, are medicated <coughs> yep. because they've had a cesarean. Yep. So our numbers of babies who are being born with medications on board is far greater. Absolutely. And I myself, when I find them in practice <coughs> in Ireland, baby feet wait to sleep between six to eight hours, it's almost have forgotten how to breastfeed. Mm. 
Um, so I, I have to say it for myself and my practice, I actually, if I eat about five hours is my maximum now. Yep. Um, I won't let that baby, because it could take me a good hour to wake that baby up to get it to feed. I'm yep. feeling, I'm seeing a lot more babies that are very sleepy yep. um, and that are not feeding like this at all anymore. And I personally theorise it's because it's had birth that happened, but that's right. just mine. And no, I, I think that's an absolutely important thing to remember because remember these women had normal, healthy labours and births unmedicated, okay? And so I do see that as well when um, a baby is born after a caesarean, put them skin to skin, there is delayed suckling. Usually by 55 minutes, those babies are ready to latch on even if you do not put them in the correct position. They're doing all that behavior that says, I know there's a breast nearby. I know I need to feed. They're sucking on their fingers. They're pinching the nipples. They're kind of pummeling at the breast. They're th kicking on the mother's abdomen to throw themselves over to the breast. They're doing that. But when you've got a mother who's been medicated, had a long labor, ended up with a caesarean, they're much slower at doing that own a activation of the physiological response to the need to breastfeed. And so we need to always keep that in balance. So okay. in a normal situation, which is what you're talking about, yeah. for me, I'm quite happy to go up to seven hours. Yeah. I mean, but I, I really think when you're talking about the abnormal, and we up at the normal, we, we've got two midwives per section, well, three midwife sections. Know, and they support those abnormal situations. They support the, the medicated mother and the medicated baby and support it with skin to skin. Yeah. Which that other case was lacking. Appeared to be lacking, yep. Yeah. Okay. So what about the stomach size? Because that comes back to how much does a baby need, a normal, healthy, full-term baby, how much does it need after the birth? And so what we do know from the physiology research is that depending on the weight of the baby, that baby's stomach size is about 15 to 30 mils in size. So obviously the bigger the baby, it might be slightly bigger, the smaller the baby, slightly smaller. At birth, that stomach is non-compliant. It's quite rigid. And so it doesn't relax easily. And really over the next few days, those first three days after the birth, that stomach becomes less compliant, or sorry, less um, non-compliant and much more able to stretch and increase in its size. So these babies often take small volumes of milk, most of them during their birth through the birth canal, during their passage through the birth canal would have swallowed some mucus, some blood. So you mix that with milk, it curdles, and what do they do? and they vomit. I often see that when they're starting to go like this, it means I'm just about to gag and puke. Um, they're very responsive, those babies, to anything that goes into the stomach. So that's not abnormal. But it is normal for them at this stage to f have small volumes, even though their stomach's not compliant and to want to gag. It's more the mix of what's in their tummies. Now, there are two types of stomach capacity. One is the physiological and one is the anatomical. So the uh, physiological capacity is what the infant can comfortably ingest at a feeding. So that's how much you put in and feel comfortable. You know, I don't know how much you ate at lunch, whether you ended lunch and thought, oh, I feel stuffed, I ate too much. Well, babies can feel the same way, and that's their physiologic compa capacity, and the anatomic capacity is what the stomach will hold at its maximum fullness. So, you know, we can stretch our stomachs. We can just keep stuffing in until we think, oh, I can't take any more, and babies can do the same kind of thing. Now, one of the other things to be aware of is about the whole thing of the gastric half emptying time. And you will have heard mothers say, oh, you know, my friend gave my, uh, her baby formula because that baby stayed full for much longer. So I think I might just, you know, give my baby formula at night because that baby, my baby will sleep longer through the night. Well, this gastric half emptying time 
actually doesn't quite match totally with that because if, if you look at the ranges, there's quite a bit of overlap. So the gastric half emptying time for formula is 65 minutes, range 27 to 98, for breast milk is 47, but the range is 16 to 86. So really, you know, there's quite a bit of overlap there and it is individual for each baby. So we cannot say that every baby, if you give them formula, they're going to sleep for six hours on that first night after birth. It, they think it may be related to what active peptides there are in the breast milk, such as the leptin, ghrelin, and obestatin, which obviously are, are related to things like energy intake and expenditure, but they're doing a lot more research on these aspects. I go to the um, lactation conference every year and I'm totally blown away by the things I learn every year about this new work that they're doing around all these <coughs> new active enzymes and peptides in breast milk that tell us a bit more about how babies feed, why they feed more frequently, why they may not grow as well or why they may grow despite mothers having small or larger amounts of milk. So this is just a table just to show you how on between days one and four, the volumes of milk are small and the volumes per feed are small because they match with the physiological capacity of that baby's stomach. And then as the time goes on, more milk is produced by the mum. And you can see there's quite a range from mother to mother. So some produce more than others. And then from about 48 to 72 hours when lactogenesis 2 or secretory activation starts, um, the volume of milk is increased and the baby is starting to say, actually, I'm starting to wake up and be real hungry. And I don't know if you've noticed day three, they tend to suddenly go, oh, you know, the last two days, I wasn't getting as much milk. And, you know, I was sleeping a lot more. And now suddenly, gosh, you know, there's life now. Look at this milk that's available. I'm hungry and they just want to feed and feed and feed and feed. And that increases significantly by day four. But of course, if there's delayed lactogenesis, which can occur for primigravidas, women who've had caesarean sections and women with diabetes, then you're not going to get those volumes of milk, maybe till days five to seven. And those mums really struggle because the baby wants to feed, but they don't have the volume in there. And so that's where that magic thing of expressing and storing colostrum comes in, which I'll talk about later. Does obesity have an effect on milk production? Um, there, it is possible that it could have. So there's some link with obesity and polycystic ovarian syndrome and milk production, but not for everybody. <coughs> so it's not a... I suppose it's not a general rule for everybody. You always have individuals who will be different. But there are a lot of women who are um, you know, significantly obese who do have problems with milk production. Sorry. Did I do a double? No. OK. So on average, most breastfed babies lose about 5 to 7 percent of their birth weight. But interestingly enough, there, there is some research that's shown even from way back since the 1980s that if a woman's had an epi epidural or IV fluids, they may lose, those babies may lose more weight um, in the first few days of life than those with no epidural, no IV fluids. So again, that's coming back to Catherine's point. You know, we're seeing far more women with spinals, epidural, caesarean sections. So we may see more of those babies losing more weight. So we need to just be going, right, what kind of birth did, did this woman have? What do I need to take note of? Um, the time frame for that weight loss after birth, when are those babies being weighed? Usually by about day five. Yeah, usually by about day five. And this is where Lindsay was talking about, you know, that day three, and I know some hospitals have a particular rule that before that baby goes home, day three usually, because most women stay in for about 48, 72 hours, they get weighed. Um, and again, I would say a normal, healthy, full term, 
breastfed baby does not need to be weighed at day three, but you always have to keep in balance. Do we know what else was in the woman? Drugs, epidurals, IV fluids, could that be affecting um, the weight loss, weight gain? And I will show you um, this study by um, Noel Weiss in 2011. She has done some recent studies which actually indicates that maybe we shouldn't be weighing babies at birth but at 24 hours post birth because those with IV fluids, epidurals actually <coughs> retain quite a bit of fluid after birth and then they lose it in those first 24 hours. I don't know if you've noticed how babies look quite puffy and swollen faced and then the next day suddenly they look different. And most mothers comment, ooh, my baby looks odd. <laughs> and the next day they go, oh, now my baby looks normal. And um, she suggests that actually we need to be thinking about whether we should weigh those babies after 24 hours to get a baseline weight from which we then calculate that 5 to 7% weight loss. So, um, you know, that's why I'm... Are interventions that we could produce if we actually did that for yeah. those babies? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm not against, um, you know, even... Lindsay's suggestion of three days, but I'd kind of more like to go, could we do it at 24 hours and get a baseline then and see what happens after that? Um, because I think we often think then babies have lost more weight than they actually have because we've started off with that straight after birth. And the thing is, families always, the first question they ask when a baby's born, how much does the baby weigh? <laughs> yeah, you know, how much does the baby weigh? And so people want to know how much does that baby weigh. So sometimes we're caught between this rock and a hard place, but should we weigh it again at 24 hours if we do weigh it straight after birth? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what this research suggests is the IV fluids versus no IV fluids, definite difference in weight loss between those babies. And then, of course, you're looking at epidural where you fluid load as well. You know, so... It is something to um, have a look at. And then there's been some suggestion by Prayer in research in 2012, which is only one piece of research I found where they've actually associated um, caesarean section without labor, so your electives, um, as being a risk factor for increased weight loss in the first days postpartum. So we don't know quite what that mechanism is, but there's a suggestion that that may be a factor to be aware of. Physiologically, these babies pass about, uh, have about six to 44 mils of urine in the bladder at birth, and most of them have peed by uh, 48 hours of age. Um, but their body does help to conserve some of that fluid because of the antidiuretic hormone level. Um, and this is that little bit of study again by Noel Weiss where she says most of them have co corrected their fluid status by 24 hours of age. Normal output to to six times per day initially and then could be heaps after that. I mean, some mothers say, look, I'm using 20 nappies a day in the, in the first uh, couple of weeks after the baby's birth because the baby's just passing urine, passing urine, pooping, and that's good. We celebrate that. I always think, you know, keep the nappies for me. I really love looking at poo and wee nappies because it tells me this baby's healthy. It's doing all the right things. It's getting all the food in and they think, oh, but it's so gross. No, keep the nappies, packets of them. I'm happy to look at them. Um, and of course, the more m the milk comes in and the more the baby feeds, the more it's going to pass urine and meconium and poo. Obviously, the weight, um, increase in weight and length is slower for breastfed than for formula-fed babies, but the head circumference isn't much difference, different. And um, the other important thing is, remember, our old growth charts were very much along the lines of what's the growth for formula-fed babies. And since 2006, when they did, uh, the WHO did that major worldwide study, They've actually made growth charts that are in our world child books now that are very specifically for breastfed babies as being the baseline, the norm that we should be looking at. Um, and obviously, the average daily weight gain is going to decrease from about three months because imagine if every baby grew the same amount from birth, we'd all be giants. And that's just a table to um, just show how the changes occur over the time. 
Um, I think that Lindsay suggested about 18 to 21 grams on average uh, per day. This was using some of the research from the, those other studies from the WHO study to look at the average weight gain nor to three months. So I kind of work on about 25 grams on average per day over a period of time because remember the more frequently you weigh you might see very small changes. Um, the less frequently you weigh you'll see bigger changes. But obviously if you've got a problem with a baby's weight loss you need to weigh more frequently rather than less. This is just one of those leaflets that's still available. It was produced in 2010 by the Ministry of Health and you can see we've got our old world child Tamariki or a little uh, insignia on it. But basically they encourage us to weigh often in the first two weeks and less, frequent, and less frequently after that unless <coughs> there is a problem with that baby and that we need to be watching that over time. And there are some mothers who absolutely are very experienced who say to me sometimes, our baby's just gone to sleep, do not weigh this baby. So what do we ask them? We ask them all about the feeding and the growth and the output um, in terms of other factors they're looking at rather than saying, oh no, we definitely have to wake this baby up and weigh it. Because experienced mothers do know, it's those who are less experienced who maybe don't know how much their babies. Uh, gaining or losing and what's normal behavior for that baby. And so remember if there's excessive weight loss or slow gain or unusual patterns or baby weight crossing centiles particularly downwards, we need to look a lot more closely and more frequently. And basically the ministry says babies should be weighed at days 5 and 10 as part of the assessment of feeding. But again, Use your judgment. You know, if you're worried about the baby's feeding earlier, way earlier at day three, day four. If you're not so worried, you could maybe weigh at day six or seven. It's the whole thing of really being actively involved with that mum and baby diet so that you can pick problems up in a timely manner.